The attorneys and guest speakers that we have here today have spent their careers focused on securities and investment fund laws, and they provide a deep level of expertise and sophistication to the field. Thank you as well to the Capital Fund Law Group for coming out today who have extensive experience forming cryptocurrency funds, and they've represented over 30 um, as of today. And uh, we're also here to you know, launch the Global Center for Investment Fund Studies and the focus on the issue of providing capital raising opportunities to emerging fundraisers, fund managers. And our focus in establishing GCIFS is to promote merit-based capital raising for emerging managers globally through research and publication and education. So we've established an ever-increasing network of directors, advisors, research fellows, and analysts in several countries throughout the world. So to any students here today or the ones listening on the live stream, if you guys want to get involved, please reach out. We'd love to have more students involved. But yeah, that's just a little bit about me and the organizations here. And I'll give it to John. Thank you. OK, thank you. Thank you, Bushra, and uh, we are uh, very excited to be here. Appreciate the invite and uh, the opportunity to uh, come here both uh, as a member of the panel, um, as, as the managing partner of Capital Fund Law Group, uh, but also uh, as um, a, a co-founder and, and uh, managing director of the Global Center for Investment Fund Studies. Uh, the Global Center for Investment Fund Studies is in its infancy. Uh, it was started last year um, by myself, and uh, back then there, there was a, a student in the finance program, program at Brigham Young University. And we uh, were looking at how much enthusiasm there is among students in the uh, investment fund space. There are really two, two types of uh, investment fund managers. We, we have an institutional level manager that uh, it has, has graduated to a, uh, a, a, certainly a larger asset base, but also has resources that, um, that would, would primarily be um, be targeting institutional level investors and their, their hiring process is fairly formal and much of the education focuses on um, in preparing to join the ranks of these, these larger um, uh, investment funds. Um, and we have representatives today of professionals who represent uh, uh, those large groups as well as, as small groups, but we, we, we have specifically uh, targeted the, the other tier of, of investment funds, and that's uh, what we call a entrepreneurial fund or a startup fund, and general characteristics uh, under the $200 million mark at, at launch, realistically most of those, especially in the, in the uh, blockchain cryptocurrency space, they tend to be in the, in the one to 10 million at launch range. And with this type of, of fund, there's not really a lot of, of education out there. We, we provided a lot of uh, education through the years on our, our website through uh, uh, eBooks and, and white papers, blog posts. Uh, on regulatory matters and on general fund formation issues. And the Global Center for Investment Fund Studies is uh, taking students and, and uh, faculty that are interested in solving some of the, the, the problems faced by uh, the industry of uh, investment fund managers and other capital raisers looking to uh, to raise capital, and it's, as you will learn today from, from the other panelists, there are a number of challenges that emerging managers uh, face in, in getting started. And uh, the, so right now we have pockets of, of students uh, throughout the world at a number of universities, including Harvard, Columbia, Brigham Young University, and uh, and uh, students in, in Australia and the Middle East, and we're, we're going to be 
in London on May 17th, um, and uh, Bushra will be uh, coming uh, along with the, the team, and then we're going from there to, to Dubai. And uh, part of this will be focused on, on our, our law firm and, and what we're doing in the space, but a lot of it is this reach, this outreach to, to talk to students about, about what we're doing. And uh, there, are, there are two studies currently underway in the planning process. Uh, the first is a, uh, a study into the predictive factors of fund managers raising capital. So private investment funds, hedge funds, are an interesting um, study group because the investment terms of a hedge fund, of especially an emerging manager, one to $10 million at launch hedge fund, are so analogous from one fund to another, uh, especially when we're looking at something like a long short equity um, options fund, and the strategies are, are, are often so analogous that they're much easier to study than a, for example, startups that, that have lots of different variables. And so we can look at, at controls um, in hedge funds in a way that I think would be helpful for generally studying uh, capital raising. And of all the, the various factors of what makes a fund uh, manager most likely to succeed, uh, we look at um, it's a combination of assets under management, uh, performance, and background. Uh, often in the investment management community, that's, that's known as pedigree. And between those three factors, you're encompassing most of the, the, the factors that will make a fund rise or fall. And our purpose with this first study is to uh, have students that are interested, uh, emerging fund managers, uh, and, and others that are uh, other researchers conduct one-on-one -on -one interviews with invest investment fund managers and, and try to get uh, data that we just don't have on uh, emerging managers. There's very, very little information that's public. And in the process, it, it provides a mentorship opportunity uh, for the students and uh, it, it provides an opportunity for the fund managers who are growing to gain some notoriety. We've, we've been very fortunate to have uh, uh, quite a bit of media coverage in, in what we're doing. Um, uh, in the past two weeks, uh, various members of our, our team have, have been interviewed by the Financial Times, the New York Times, uh, Bloomberg, The Hill, um, CNBC, and there, there's a lot of, of, of buzz and excitement, and there's an excitement among the students, and there's a real need in the industry. And so we're, we're looking to academia to help provide answers, and um, students come to us that are unable to raise capital or that are in their early stage, and for so long I had just been turning them away until I, I thought of, of seeing how they could kind of come in and and get involved and, and, and network. And from that, uh, we've already seen really good things. Uh, networking, you know, people, uh, emerging managers combining forces, and uh, really providing opportunities for networking in that incubator phase as we all work on, on ways to, um, to uh, raise capital. And, and, and the focus is merit-based capital raising, so finding finding ways that um, the relationship-based fundraising, which is based in, in large part on uh, pre-existing circumstances, family, personal wealth, uh, which for an emerging fund is not necessarily indicative of, of success. However, that is what we have found to be the number one predictive factor. If someone has a, a strong seed investor, whether or not that relationship is based on uh, affinity or, or, or um, kinship, the subsequent investors 
are, are given great confidence. And so by, by studying factors and ultimately finding ways to truly link interested fund managers, uh, that is, in interested investors with um, fund managers that, that have shown objective uh, success, predictive uh, uh, success criteria, then, then we can sort of democratize the capital raising process. The other, and I'll touch on it only briefly, is a, a, a worldwide study. This first is, is really focused on New York. Um, and this other is a, is a worldwide study that's, that we're working on now to look for answers for a particular missing element of the emerging manager fund space, and, and that is, is custody. And we'll, we'll get into that later, but that's something, especially for law students, for uh, law professors, studies, uh, study participants, come to us with, with uh, any ideas you have or, or any um, interested parties, and you know, we're, we're in the infancy of this, and we'd love to, to bring you in and, and uh, get you involved. So um, with that, uh, I will explain the format of, of today's presentation. It's, uh, this, this is the first GCIFS Global Center for Investment Fund Studies event, and it's Q&A based, and we have two, two sets of panels. The first is focused on how to form a cryptocurrency fund, what regulatory issues are involved with cryptocurrency, what tax issues, and what um, uh, specific obstacles we need to navigate when forming the, the crypto fund. The second panel, uh, which you will find very interesting, uh, is the uh, capital raising process. And so we have uh, uh, an investor and um, fund manager that, that focuses and has focused on the emerging space. And, and then we have uh, a, uh, a uh, investor that, uh, or I'm sorry, a, um, a trader that, that's heavily involved with, with that. Um, and we'll have a, a brief intermission. So uh, first uh, person I want to introduce you to is uh, Burke McDavid. Burke advises both established and emerging managers in organizing and operating private investment funds, both hedge funds and private equity funds, employing a variety of strategies including emerging markets, distressed debt, energy, real estate, and funds of funds. Well, thanks for having me, John. Um, it's a pleasure to be here. Uh, John asked me to come and, and participate on the panel, and um, I'll just make a few remarks just sort of regarding kind of where we are currently with respect to the, the regulatory regime. Um, the one thing I was sort of reflecting on as, as John was speaking was that, you know, when I started um, at Aiken Gump in 1998, um, I didn't know what a hedge fund was and kind of got into the area through, through circumstances, but I've really enjoyed it. And I'm reminded that uh, over the years, you know, the types of assets that people invest in obviously vary uh, from traditional securities or commodities or what have you. But, you know, from time to time, people come along with very interesting new ideas about uh, investments. You know, we've had, you know, wine funds, antique cars, um, you almost kind of name it. And then now the new thing is, you know, 2017, sort of like a tidal wave, um, we, we were hit with, you know, cryptocurrencies. And, um, and it's, it's been all the rage, and firms like John have been uh, very active in helping a lot of emerging managers uh, get off the ground. Um, from where I sit, um, we, we've certainly engaged some folks that are... Um, have launched uh, funds that invest in cryptocurrencies. Uh, and, you know, it's like anything, you, you know, where, where are you starting? Um, what is it? What is the asset? And um, that will dictate who the regulators are, what rules you need to follow, and ultimately what your fund terms are. So with the cryptocurrency, it's really interesting because I don't know what the hell they are. Um, <laughs> You know, uh, some act, smell, feel like a security. Others, you know, act more like a currency. Um, 
and you know how it's shaking out and you know it's sort of fitting into the pre-existing boxes that exist uh, which is things like you know Bitcoin that act and feel more like a currency are considered currencies and are governed um, much like gold would be for um, so governed by CFTC um, you know tokens that uh, you know people give you money in exchange for a token that represents whatever the hell that represents uh, an expectation of earning profit from the efforts of others investment contract security securities land and that has a lot of implications right for all the different players involved um, those uh, exchanges so if they're operating an exchange that is involved with tokens securities exchange right um, and to date, you know, I think there's been rampant noncompliance, which has been evidenced by the number of actions that the SEC and the CFTC have been bringing. Um, I think trying to force, as they figure things out, but trying to force the market participants into these, you know, uh, established boxes. Um, and likely, you know, through future legislation and, you know, if Congress can stop being dysfunctional to get something done, then eventually, you know, there's going to be some new rules that emerge, no doubt. Um, so the two primary players, CFTC, SEC, um, state banking regulators, um, you know, with respect to uh, state money transfer laws, the IRS. Um, I know we have one of our panelists can sort of address a lot of the uh, tax issues involved um, that are very interesting, and I'll be I'll be interested to hear because now that 2017 tax returns have been filed. Um, I guess we'll see what the IRS, you know, what they do, and see who's reporting and who's not. Um, and then, you know, any any money laundering issues, um, and I think you know Ian can probably address some of those as well from the the non-U.S. perspective. Um, but it just strikes me that it, you know, it's just it's it is a new it's new. There's a lot to learn, but there are a lot of existing laws. And so if you're considering launching an investment fund, um, first is really understanding what you have, because whether it's a security or a commodity is just a fact-based question. And there are existing case law and, and guidance uh, that will tell you what you're dealing with. Um, and once you know what you have and you know, who your regulator is going to be, uh, then, you know, how are you going to trade that? How are you going to invest it? Is it more illiquid and more conducive to a closed-end fund? Or is it uh, more conducive, you know, to trading and, and being able to treat it more like a hedge fund, an open-ended fund with more liquidity for, for investors? Um, but really understanding the, the compliance is important. I mean, any investor, you know, John talked about uh, capital raising, and increasingly the barriers to entry into being an, an asset manager, a manager of other people's money, uh, is a lot higher than it used to be. When I, when I started in uh, really, you know, in this space in the late 90s, uh, you know, two guys in a garage could start a fund and not really be uh, regulated for the most part. Um, obviously, you know, following the typical exemptions and what have you. Um, and that's just simply, close to impossible these days, um, at least to be able to, to land that seed investor, um, to gain the confidence of family offices or other institutional investors, they want to see that you've got the compliance infrastructure. They want to see that you, you, you know, have all the traps, um, that you have you know, proper advisors and other service providers. Um, so it's, um, I, mean, that, I think that's sort of the extent of what I wanted to just sort of lay out there before the Q&A part, uh, just to give you a flavor of an overview of the regulatory aspects. Great, thank you. <coughs> All right, now uh, introduce Ian Gobin. Uh, Ian is with, with Harneys, uh, a uh, offshore attorney in, in the Cayman Islands. We work with with um, Harney's extensively uh, outstanding firm. Um, and uh, in, um, prior to joining Harney's, Ian was the global head of investment funds teams at Appleby and prior a partner at Walker's. Before going offshore in 2001, 
Ian trained and qualified as a solicitor at Clifford, Clifford Chance in London, working in the Capital Markets Group. Ian is in the, uh, registered and licensed in the Cayman Islands and the British Virgin Islands. He also advises institutional and private clients throughout Europe and North America on fund matters. Thanks, Ian. Good afternoon. As John pointed out, so I actually I run the, fund, the, the investment funds and the fintech group for, for Honeys, and I'm based in Grand Cayman. I guess the first thing to sort of mention is, you know, uh, why, why Cayman? What's that got to do with, you know, the establishment of, uh, of an investment fund? Uh, fundamentally, it is down to tax and regulation. Um, when you are setting up um, a, a, a fund vehicle, um, you, the first thing is you, you analyze where your investors are going to be located. If you have investors that are outside of the U.S., or are in the US but non-taxable, that's why you'll set up a Cayman vehicle, because they will invest in the Cayman vehicle. Our background in crypto um, goes back to, um, it was just over three years ago that we set up our first crypto asset fund. And um, every time a, a, a new asset class or an asset class that we haven't heard of or we're, uh, we're familiar with uh, comes up, there's lots of chatter amongst the partners in terms of just what this, what this new asset class is. And sure enough, um, when it came up in, in the partners meeting that uh, we, had, we had a crypto asset fund, it was, okay, what's that? What are they doing? Uh, it was a very simple strategy. They were buying Bitcoin. Mm. That was it. It was a buy hold strategy. And we were scratching our heads <coughs> thinking, well, how, how is that? If someone's paying them a 2% um, management fee and a 20% performance fee to just buy Bitcoin. Where, where's the magic to that? Um, there's magic if, you, if you're buying gold, there, there's, but, but they, they, I didn't really, well, we didn't really see that there was any. Over the three years, um, we set up a, a lot of um, crypto asset funds. Now they are complex. Now the investment strategies are, um, yes, you'll see um, buy, buy sell as part of the uh, overall strategy, but it could well be a whole array of um, uh, crypto uh, currencies that are being purchased, all in uh, various sort of um, um, stages of, uh, of success. Um, it could also be that they're investing in pre-ICO funding. It could be they're investing in ICOs themselves. It could be that they're investing in shares of companies that are, are, uh, either develop or invest in uh, blockchain or, or a digital asset uh, technology. Um, and then it really comes down to when, when you're setting up your fund, just what your investment strategy is going to look like and how liquid your portfolio is actually going to be. Uh, and there is a real structuring question in terms of how you're going to set up your hedge fund. By definition, a hedge fund has liquidity. You know, your investors will expect to, to sort of come in and out of the fund on a regular basis. When it comes to the terms that we see, we, we, we generally sort of see an initial, initial lockup period where investors won't be able to get out of the fund, where, where their money is locked up uh, for a one or two year period. That get, get really gives you as the manager a chance to uh, start developing your funds, start developing um, uh, positive performance, um, and it gives you a chance to, to, to do all of that. But at the end of that period, that's when investors will, will be able to, uh, on, a, on a contractual, on a pre-contractual basis, uh, be able to redeem out of the fund, usually quarterly. Because of that quarterly um, um, uh, ability to redeem, your, your overall um, portfolio of assets uh, need, needs, to be, needs to be liquid. Now, where you've invested in uh, pre-ICO uh, pre funding, or indeed in some ICOs, you've really got a question that the, the actual liquidity that you have there. And that's why we build in what are called side pockets into this open-ended hedge fund vehicle. Now, in the side pockets, they are illiquid um, investments that are made. So everyone understands at the very beginning that, for example, 20% of the, of the overall portfolio will go into more illiquid assets and go into these side pockets. So that when you do redeem on your, quarterly ba on your quarterly basis, or you have the right to redeem on a quarterly basis, after the lockup period, you can't redeem out of the assets which are in the side pockets. Only when the manager deems that the investments in those side pockets have been realized, i.e. that they, they, they've sold those positions, would you uh, be entitled to redeem or, or um, entitled to uh, a return on your monies from those positions in the side pockets. Very important, side pockets fell out of favor many years ago as a result of the financial crisis, um, as they were being abused by, by some managers in the way in which they were, they were calculating the net asset value of the funds. They are very much in vogue and, and essential when you're, when you're contemplating setting up a, a crypto asset fund. 
So it's one more hurdle that you need to get across to when you're speaking with your investors that, that side pockets are essential for the overall structuring of the portfolio. From a tax perspective, um, again, you know, going back to what, I, what my opening remarks about, about why Cayman, um, <coughs> we typically see there are, there are three um, structural choices to choose from when you're setting up your, your hedge fund. You could potentially have a side-by-side -side fund with uh, uh, your, your US investors going into the Delaware um, entity that you'll establish and your, your rest of the world and US non-taxables going into a, a Cayman vehicle. And both those vehicles will run side-by-side. <coughs> There are certain disadvantages with that, one of which would be, for example, that every time you put a trade on with your domestic, you've got to put a trade on with your offshore, and, and that costs you each time um, more money. Um, another um, choice would be uh, where you set up a mini master fund, where you have um, the Cayman entity uh, effectively um, uh, feeding into, into the Delaware um, uh, master fund. Um, there are also certain disadvantages with that, um, the, the main structure that we see being established for, for crypto asset funds and generally is a, a Cayman master feeder fund where you have a Cayman entity as, as, the, uh, as the feeder for uh, all the investors from the rest of the world and US non-taxables and then um, a, a Cayman corporate vehicle that the feeder will go into um, and at, at, at that point you, you have the, uh, a, a Delaware feeder for, for US investors coming into the, the, the Cayman master fund. That's your quintessential structure that, that we see being st um, set up. Uh, I think um, one, one other thing to sort of mention would be, you know, when it, when it comes to setting up the, the fund structures, um, it's not for the faint-hearted. There are um, issues with, uh, and challenges with, when setting up a, 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 a long-short equity fund. Um, when you're setting up a crypto asset fund, there are more challenges to overcome and more hurdles to overcome, um, most of which can be... Um, they, they can be overcome, but it, it, it requires a certain, uh, even more time and patience to, to get things right, to explain things to your investors, to explain things to the service providers you're going to be working with. It's a relatively small ecosystem uh, of service providers that you will be, you will be working with, uh, be they um, um, mainstream fund administrators, um, auditors, or indeed in, independent directors. One thing I also sort of mention is um, subscriptions in kind. Um, very popular uh, as, as, a, as a topic to, uh, to discuss, and that would be, uh, you know, can you take in uh, cryptocurrencies as subscriptions into your fund and not just fiat currencies? Um, the more common answer these days is yes, you can, um, but that would generally require the appointment of, of, of um, what's been coined a crypto administrator. So in addition to having a mainstream fund administrator that will do, uh, amongst other things, um, work on the, on the net asset value calculations of the fund, as well as the, the whole KYC AML processes for the investors coming in, there's going to be enhanced due diligence required in respect of the crypto subscriptions. And they're generally dealt with by a crypto administrator, an entity that's going to match the person to the, to the wallet, uh, as well as collect the whole um, other uh, sides of the, of the um, KYC AML uh, process. I think um, uh, Berg sort of mentioned that... Uh, for, for any investor going into, um, be it a <coughs> Delaware fund or, or indeed a Cayman fund, they will be required to undertake and, and go through a, a huge process of um, KYC, KYC, so know your customer, an AML, anti-money laundering uh, procedures and processes. It's absolutely essential to ensure that everything that's going into your fund is clean, um, and, and particularly so when it, when it comes to crypto. Um, there's a huge target on any manager's back if they, if they want to establish a, a crypto asset fund. Um, either from the SEC, uh, from um, uh, regulators around the world, uh, or, or indeed, you know, home regulators. So it's essential that everything you're doing, you're working with, you have to work with the very best fund, um, uh, service providers out there to ensure the structure you're setting up is, um, is going to be absolutely flawless. Uh, for the time being, I'd like to leave it there. Thank you. Great, thank you. Um, and then uh, uh, finally, we have Hai Tang, who's the managing director at Anderson Tax. Um, and, uh, and Hai Tang um, has extensive experience in federal and international tax consulting and compliance for alternative investment funds and startup companies. Um, and Hai received a, a BS in physics um, from uh, University of Science and Technology of China 
a PhD in physics from University of Chicago, and an MS in taxation from uh, Golden Gate University. Uh, and uh, Haiteng has a, a particular focus in the, the cryptocurrency space. And, and we had a, a tax, uh, our firm, Capital Fund Law, uh, put on a, a tax focused uh, crypto uh, workshop uh, just two days ago. And we, we detailed a lot of, of these issues. And, and um, Hai Tang wasn't able to make it. And, and, and he's going to be able to uh, address some of those issues uh, here today. And uh, the importance, I, I, I can't stress enough, of, of choosing and working closely with an entire team of service providers. Uh, the, the, the US lawyer tends to quarterback the transaction to bring the parties together, the fund administrator, auditor, broker dealer, ta uh, uh, tax um, expert, banks, et, et cetera. But uh, the importance of, of working with uh, quality providers such as, um, such as, as these and, uh, and Haiting uh, certainly uh, is one of those. Thank you, John. Thank you. Uh, so, yeah, I'm um, hi. Uh, uh, very glad to be to be here and invited here. Um, last time I was here, uh, more than 20 years ago, when I was a graduate student visiting uh, Harvard campus. So happy to be back. <laughs> um, uh, I'm going to focus on the tax issues for uh, cryptocurrencies. Um, uh, you know, it's, it's really, it suffice to say, as Burke was mentioning, that um, the, the huge rise in cryptocurrency valuation and the profits that people made uh, during 2017 has not gone unnoticed by the IRS. And I think the IRS has uh, an indication that they're going to really focus on this area uh, as a, um, you know, area for audit. Um, for 2017 and going forward. And uh, you may have heard about um, news that uh, the IRS uh, served John Doe summons on Coinbase to force them to disclose their uh, you know, client uh, trading uh, information because back in 2013 through 2014, there, uh, three years, there only the US had only about 400 people, uh, taxpayers, disclosed um, um, Bitcoin transactions, and uh, sure enough that the um, the IRS won uh, in court, and the um, Bitcoin had uh, sorry, uh, Coinbase had to issue um, disclose customers uh, see, uh, over fourteen thousand of them that uh, had transactions that resulted in uh, proceeds over twenty thousand dollars. So now, um, of course, the IRS is tracking down those four, uh, whatever fourteen thousand that didn't disclose, and then serve them notice, and you know, basically. Uh, so uh, and more to come because we have a lot more money, um, you know, made in, in seventeen. Uh, you know, having said that, the IRS has only provided uh, one piece of guidance on cryptocurrency. This was back in two thousand fourteen. And at the time, it was just had um, Bitcoin in mind. Um, and basically, the IRS said that the uh, you know, cryptocurrencies are uh, property, right? not currency. And you have to do reporting uh, accordingly. Okay. Uh, unfortunately, that's not sufficient for a lot of uh, taxpayers, uh, especially with the crypto hedge funds, uh, because Property is really broad. It includes anything, right? Uh, stocks, securities, uh, commodities, real estate, chairs or desks, you know, everything. Uh, so what is it? Right? So that's the first thing that um, anyone is trading, especially as a hedge fund, trading cryptocurrencies have to take a position on. Um, so is it a security, commodity, or something else? Uh, and that, if, that has a huge impact uh, from a tax standpoint.
time. So for example, a lot of these special uh, rules, tax rules related to trading, for example, uh, watch sale rules, they only apply to stocks and securities. So if you take a position that um, you know, cryptocurrency is a commodity, then you're out of it. So you don't have to worry about watch sale rules. Um, so that's one example. There are several others. Uh, so that's hugely important. Um, and um, that we, uh, we don't have any guidance on, you know, uh, uh, as tax advisors, right? So what we do in these uh, circumstances is to uh, help uh, clients uh, sort of develop a reasonable position that still, that's not um, obviously um, in conflict with existing law and apply it consistently, right, for, for that particular uh, taxpayer. And of course, if the IRS provides guidance in some future date, then we may have to modify our position. So this is one. Um, another important issue is, is uh, what we're facing is uh, uh, that's not particularly uh, special for cryptocurrency um, funds. It's for all hedge funds, basically a US <laughs> trader or an investor, right? So, a trader fund can deduct most of the expenses as uh, ordinary business expense, whereas an investor fund can only deduct such expenses as an investment expense. As, as those of you know that if you, you know, do your own tax returns on an individual basis, that uh, you can, it's a lot easier to deduct your uh, business expense as opposed to investment expense. So that makes a huge, huge difference. And then there's another issue which goes back to the classification of you know, commodity versus security um, is that, um, so th this is the impact on um, uh, foreign investors in, in a fund, right? So uh, in that case, um, there is a self-trading safe harbor in the US law that basically applies to if a fund that's just trading for its own account, stock, securities, and certain types of commodities that's regularly traded on an established exchange, then um, the fund is not treated as conducting a US, uh, US trade or business. Therefore, the income generated mostly would not be um, taxable in the US if it's allocated to a foreign investor. Right, so, but with you know, cryptocurrencies, we don't know, right? We don't know. I think that it, you have to sort of come up with a position, you know, do, is it a, a security, a commodity? And then if it's a commodity, do you think it's sort of, you know, some, some sort of commodity that's traded on an established exchange? So for example, is Coinbase considered an established exchange, right? So. Those things that uh, we often have to work with our, you know, clients to kind of form a position and and, and do it, but be willing to uh, adjust uh, as we receive more guidance from the IRS. So, yeah. Great, thank you. Thank you. Appreciate it. So, uh, in in turning to the questions, let's let's first uh, tackle some of the regulatory. Questions, and so uh, a, a a common question uh, that's asked is: Is a uh, cryptocurrency a security, a commodity, a and what type of asset is it, and how does that affect how it's regulated? Um, and you know, I'll, I'll start off by by saying we've had uh, plenty of of uh, initial feedback from both the CFTC and the SEC to safely say, you better be careful about both. Uh, if it, we don't know yet what the full ramifications will be, and because uh, there is a, a, a large um, gap in, in what, we, what we believe could be regulated and what is regulated, we shouldn't assume that because something has not been regulated, it won't. Um, you, uh, we'll find out shortly when we 
start seeing some of these enforcement actions. But we do know that the, the CFTC has, has made a statement that commodities are, are uh, that uh, cryptocurrencies are commodities, but they are not uh, treated as currency because they are not accepted as um, legal tender in any jurisdiction, but they are uh, considered uh, commodities, and as such, to the extent that, that the fund is planning to do any derivatives uh, trading on those commodities, or um, under Dodd-Frank uh, and, and some expansion of the CFTC, if the uh, if the fund plans to even use leverage, then there is uh, a hook that would put them regulated by the CFTC. But just because something is regulated by the CFTC at this point doesn't mean it's not also regulated by the SEC. And, and time will tell how things, how things work out. But from a practical perspective, that's, that's, my, that's sort of my view is that um, ultimately, um, both of these, uh, both of these jurisdictions are going to continue to to regulate simultaneously cryptocurrencies until we start to parse out uh, categories and, and and true tests for for different types of of uh, digital assets. And so, um, Burke, I would uh, turn the question to you. Um, what is the what is the current regula regulatory state um, from the SEC's perspective of cryptocurrencies? Well, you know they've they've made comments, and it's and it's evident through their enforcement actions that um, effectively I don't I don't I, and I think it was one of the uh, them that said they haven't seen an ICO that doesn't have the hallmarks of a security, um, uh, which is pretty telling. Which and with the number of of ICOs that have happened, that's uh, that's the number of people that are non-compliant, <laughs> according to the SEC, right? So um, they they've been they've come out pretty strong um, with respect to that. But it, you know, each of these is a fact-based determination. It, it, you know, w what is it? Um, what are its characteristics? What are you doing with it? Um, we'll all. I mean, you can't just cryptocurrency is a nice broad term, but it whatever that technology is and does is what will determine kind of what bucket you're going to fall under. And I would just note that the this SEC and the CFTC have, have historically had turf battles over things, but they seem pretty, uh, pretty cozy with one another in trying to figure out um, you know, how to regulate blockchain-related technologies and, and ICOs and things of that nature. Yeah. I I agree, and, and uh, the the decision of our firm to not represent ICOs at this point um, is really based on on that that uncertainty and you know, our view that uh, if you are going to do a, an ICO, you should be um, using uh, s considerable resources and engaging the services of. Uh, the, the, the largest, most established um, law firms that have the uh, ability and the expertise to really be that uh, that in innovator, and, and I, I guess the that's a good thing to point out that when you're looking at, say, a boutique law firm like ours, we have a very very narrow and deep um, expertise, and so when something does not look uh, like a, a, a safe and, and, and straightforward offering, uh, we, we will uh, generally um, refer you to another law firm. And in, and in a lot of cases, the decision of whether you should be pursuing this, you know, this more advanced strategy, um, decision of whether you should be doing an ICO, comes down to uh, how, how much resources do you have and how much risk do you have? For, for a client with starting off with less than 200 million, 
um, certainly sub 100 million, you really don't have any business being the first innovator in a particular area unless you have the resources to handle not only a judgment, but even a, a lawsuit. And so <coughs> kind of one thing to keep in mind is if fir firms like, like uh, Aiken Gump, they, they really have a breadth of, of um, experience and, and can be um, a, a real innovator uh, in those areas. And so um, with respect to ICOs, yeah, the, to say that we don't touch them is not for me to say um, they're inherently bad uh, or that they're certainly going to come to uh, regulatory trouble, but because they're so complex um, that, that we need to uh, be very careful. I would say, I mean, even, you know, at Aiken Gump, I, I don't think we're, we're at a comfort level um, on the ICOs either. Um, you know, we'll, we'll see as things develop. I mean, I think even if, if you're a fund manager and you're investing in cryptocurrencies and you're investing in ICOs, you know, another, another issue is if, if those offerings are unregistered securities offerings without an, a proper exemption, uh, you could have some underwriter liability. And if, you know, if, the, if, the, if there's so much non-compliance that the SEC just can't catch all the fish in their net, um, and they've, they've made reference to, you know, gatekeepers and making sure they're doing their jobs, they're going to start going after the sources of money that are allowing these illegal activities um, uh, to be captured, right? So, the, the, you know, if you're a fund and you're investing in ICOs, you're, you're essentially enabling that, that <coughs> conduct. Um, that's just something to think about. And, and we get the question a lot is, how, how should we be investing in ICOs or what restrictions should there be um, with, with a, a, a private fund? You have multiple sources of, of liability. Uh, as the fund investment advisor, um, you, you're, you owe a fiduciary duty to the fund. And, and so looking at the, certainly the, the percentage of the portfolio that, that is dedicated to ICOs, looking at the nature uh, of the ICOs, um, ultimately, um, I, I, I don't think that the SEC is going to string everybody up. Um, I think there's probably going to be, and it takes, takes courage to be, to be the innovators of ICOs. We certainly don't want to have the liability of an underwriter. Um, and so ways to, ways to mitigate this that, that we suggest is one, use only the very most reputable exchanges, and two, do very heavy due diligence on any ICOs. I mean, right now, I don't, I don't think a lot of, uh, of, of managers are, are, are looking uh, to uh, invest in ICOs right now anyway. Uh, but, but when they do, to exercise extreme um, vetting. And then finally, uh, limit the percentage of the portfolio. And in some cases, we've even advised for a fund manager to raise their their level of uh, of wealth requirement beyond what is required, and depending on the state where an investment advisor resides, wh whether that's um, a a fund in a state like uh, New York that has a, a private fund advisor's exemption that uh, allows a a client to uh, to be a accredited investor, uh, an investor to be merely an accredited investor versus uh, other states that are these post, call them post Dodd Frank states, uh, such as Texas, California, Massachusetts um, has actually gone the other direction where you're, re you're required to not only have the accredited standard, but the qualified client standard when, when the fund is less than 150 million. And so 
for certain types of funds, we're recommending if you are going to do something like this, you actually raise that, that standard higher just for, for your own protection. Um, usually when I say that, they, they opt to just uh, have a, a very, very small uh, cap for their, their ICOs. Um, so the, the, the next question is on, on tax. Um, and uh, we know we had uh, changes um, to the Tax Reform Act, uh, changes to the, to the, um, the tax code in the, the form of the Tax Reform Act that, uh, that created a, um, a, a change to the carried interest rule that, that would affect um, how a fund manager is able to uh, take compensation. And, and hi, Tang, could you, could you uh, explain, explain that and how that affects private funds? Yeah, in terms of the, I think John is talking about the carry interest uh, legislation and the uh, tax reform that became effective, uh, you know, beginning of this year. Uh, so in the past, um, well, first of all, in, in general, right, so uh, fund manager, uh, you know, besides charging annual management fee, uh, also gets a uh, sh uh, share of the um, profits, uh, let's say 20%, right, that's called carry. So, uh, and, and usually uh, that, the allocation of that income to the, uh, to the general partner or uh, a fund manager has the same character as that out when it's allocated to the limited partners. This was in the past. So for example, if you have uh, capital gain for assets that's held for more than a year, it's long-term capital gain, and it's long-term capital gain for both the investors and the fund manager. Right. So with the tax reform, uh, that has been modified. So for the fund, ma uh, fund managers carry uh, to qualify for long-term capital gain, uh, the holding period has to be over three years. Um, so, um, so that that causes some some issues with, um, especially hedge fund uh, has the biggest impact because uh, typically real estate, uh, venture capital, private equity, you know, a lot of times that they meet the three-year holding period, but hedge funds may not. Um, so people, um, you know, sometimes think about strategies to try to get there. Uh, for example, uh, when they um, sell, uh, liquidate a position, maybe they don't liquidate all of it, they liquidate the, uh, the limited partner's portion of it, uh, whereas the general partner would just receive the investments in kind. From the from the fund, right? The fund would make a distribution, and then they uh, that way at least they earn the carry. Uh, but uh, I think that they would still have to hold it for um, a, a further period of time until the entire holding period meets uh, the three-year um, you know requirement to, to qualify for three-year um, for the long-term capital gain under the tax reform. Right. Um, we're, we're a little bit over on, on time, um, and uh, uh, the panelists would be available for, for additional uh, <coughs> questions after uh, that's over. So we'll take a, a brief um, intermission here, and then we'll bring out the, uh, the capital raising uh, panel. And, and thank, thank you to each of you. Um, a great respect for, for these uh, gentlemen, and have uh, uh, been very impressed with with the work they've done and uh, thank you